Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a Bible study, and I am talking about some political climates that we have going on in our country right now as well. So I hope you have a few minutes to hang out with me. Um, I want to show you some very important things in Scripture. We're plowing through the book of Isaiah right now in chapter 66. We have about 10 days left until probably what I agree with a lot of people, the most important election that we've ever had in this country um, for its very existence. I want to absolutely tell you 100% because, yes, we've had in our nation's history, we've had some very serious, dangerous moments in our country with George Washington and the British, the Civil War, and how Abraham Lincoln stopped that Civil War, freed the slaves. Well, this is, this is to me, that I, what I have seen the last four years is not sustainable for our country to keep going in the fashion that it's going. It has, there have been people that are running our government that are absolutely trying for a new change, a different way, a, a way that's a dictator, it's like a dictatorship. They call Donald Trump a fascist and they keep saying it over and over and over and over again. Joe Biden, um, Kamala Harris and all of them keep saying that and they're trying to get them to tone the rhetoric down. Uh, this is a rare occasion today. We saw Mitch McConnell and Mike Johnson get on and say, hey, you need to tone the rhetoric down. This is dangerous. You know, we've already had two or three assassination attempts on, on Donald Trump. You got to knock it off. Um, no problem, Sister Minette. That's fine. Good, good to have you come on for a few minutes anyway. I'll be around for a little bit here while we go through this. It should be, it should be good. Um, let me, let me start with this. Okay. Let me start with this in the title today. This is Isaiah 66, 9. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? What is, what is God talking about in Isaiah 66, 9? Is that got something to do with America? No, that's got something to do with Israel. And that's got something to do with uh, them being scattered among the nations thousands of years ago when Babylon came in, Nebuchadnezzar drug them all away, and they were dispersed from being a nation all the way until 1948. And God is, is saying to Isaiah, write this down um, in verse 8, Who hath heard of such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to be, bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, that's Jerusalem, she brought forth her children. And so God is using the birth of a woman to compare the rebirth of Israel in 1948. This was a prediction thousands of years ago by Isaiah. Why am I using the book of Isaiah in chapter 66 as a springboard and a roadmap to the literal second coming? Because Jesus talked about this moment in Matthew 24, in the book of Luke, uh, chapter 21, and he compared Israel to a fig tree. It was a parable. A parable is a secret story. It's a, it's a story where if you want to know by God what he's, what he's talking about, you have to study his word. You have to ask him for discernment. You have to ask him to show you the truth. Because a lot of people will misquote scripture. They'll take you in different directions for days, trying to say, oh, he wasn't talking about that. You know, the Mormons are really good at trying to convince people that everything happens in Salt Lake City, Utah, or the Jehovah Witnesses with e. Ellen G. White, the Muslims with Muhammad, and all of that. And by the way, for those of you who say, all I need to do is believe in Jesus and be saved, my question to you is, which Jesus are you talking about? Are you talking about the Mormon Jesus? Are you talking about the Islam version of Jesus, or the Chrislam, or the Roman Catholic? version of Jesus or the um, Jehovah Witness Jesus? Or are, are, you, are you talking about the Jesus in the four Gospels that died for you, for the sins of the world, and what that meant, what he did on the cross for you? That Jesus, without some organization's name attached to it. That's a blood covenant. That's the Jesus that you need to get to know, the one that I got to know, the one that I accepted when I was 12 years old. But we're looking at this political climate today. We're 10 days from the election. Not only is this the most important election of, of, our, of our nation's history, in my opinion, why? 
because our nation is imploding. It's looking like Israel uh, 3,500 years ago, where it's imploding from within. It looks like Rome imploding from within. It's not sustainable. If we get Kamala Harris, guys and gals, um, do you want nuclear? You know what? Um, what was it? Uh, what was his name? Uh, RFK Jr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said uh, this morning. He said he he told the voters. He said, "If you want World War Three, then vote for Kamala Harris." <laughs> All right, World War Three with nukes. If you want that, then vote for Kamala Harris. If you want to put that off for a while, then vote for Donald Trump. All right. This is more than just a man that we're voting for. We're voting for the survival of our country. Now, the problem that I have with myself, and this tends to be a problem, is that when you're a truth seeker and you, you go into the scriptures and you look at what God has to say about our environment and in the past and the future and what's going to happen, um, you have to tell people things that's not popular. Uh, and with that said, from a human intellectual perspective, we want to vote and do the right thing. We want to vote, you know, and try to get Donald Trump elected. But with that said, since I've been studying for so long now about where, how does all of this fit, the roadmap, which I had a Bible study the other day, it was called uh, Route 66 to the Second Coming in Isaiah 66. And it's, this is a little bit of a continuation but I'm trying to set some groundwork to show people who may not study the Bible very much that this is really not about America at the end of the day. America is going to absolutely be a catalyst to launch the whole world into the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the seven-year tribulation, which is, well, that's those stories, those cryptic stories that we read about in the book of Revelation um, passages of the Old Testament like Isaiah chapter 49 that talks about 4950 that talks about Babylon this daughter of Babylon daughter means not the father it's the daughter okay so not the original Babylon but we're talking about a future Babylon there's lots of references to our nation that is cloaked and I know that a lot of people might say it's the Roman Catholic Church the only thing I want to tell you is that the Roman Catholic Church right now doesn't have a military. They don't. They have a religious system, and they have a pope, but that's all they've got. Okay, they do play a role, of course. They do play a big role in the seven-year tribulation. It's been set, rumored and 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 studied that maybe the uh, this pope that we have could possibly be the false prophet of the Book of Revelation. I can tell you all hundred percent he is a false prophet. There's no question about there's that's not even debatable that he's a false prophet. Okay? But is he that guy that we read about in the book of Revelation? I don't know. They he can't walk very far. He's getting to be like Jimmy Carter, where they gotta wheel him around all over the place in a wheelchair. So I don't know if that man has the physical go juice to run seven years with the Antichrist. I doubt it. But there's a lot of Antichrist in the world. There's a lot of false prophets that have gone out, Jesus said. That's how you'll know it's the last time. We're in this little roadmap Bible study this evening. So what am I saying about America? I'm saying that if you love your country, you do the right thing, you get out and vote, and then you pray to God, I'm gonna, pr I'm gonna come back on this Sunday, this is gonna be October 27th, and pray. Pray for a Donald Trump win. I'm not going to just assume he's going to win. I'm still praying for it. At the end of the day, may God's will be done. Obama has, um, Eva, Obama has a spirit of antichrist. Is he the man of sin in the book of Revelation? I don't know. I, I mean, he's a candidate. I can't write him off completely, but I don't think so in myself. I don't know. I don't think so. But, you know, let's just say that he is a, he is an antichrist. There's a lot of them. Jesus said, um, many would come in my name. Uh, saying, I am the Christ and deceive many. And so he was talking to Israel and he's warning Israel, um, take heed that no man deceive you. Because when, this, was, this is what's crazy about it, guys and gals, is like the seven year tribulation hasn't even started yet and already that strong delusion is on the earth right now. Imagine what it'll be like after the church is removed off of this earth and then, and then that strong delusion goes into full force. 
So Jesus was warning Israel. He's like, don't, don't listen to these people that say they're me or a Messiah or whatever, because the religious Jews are absolutely looking for their Messiah. And um, the political uh, aspect of Israel is absolutely looking for someone that can help them just live in peace, right? Peace and safety, peace and security. We read about that in the Bible. And this is what we know is the catalyst to start the seven-year tribulation because somebody has to come in and calm things down for a time. You're welcome, Eva. Um, this is why I, I've been saying for quite a while now, it's starting to look more clear and more clear to me that uh, let's just say that Donald Trump is the perfect candidate to, st to help create the environment for the Antichrist. He is not the Antichrist, ladies and gentlemen. Whoever, someone in a Christian community comes in and tells me, oh, he's the Antichrist, he's the Antichrist. I'm like, okay, well, Satan's been trying to kill him, rob from him, steal from him, persecute him, throw him in prison. He doesn't do that to the man of sin. He helps the man of sin, okay? That doesn't make any sense. It's a, scrap, it's a square peg that you're trying to fit into a round hole. It don't work. But what does fit like a round peg in a round hole is somebody to get elected and to go into the Middle East and around the world and calm things down to set the environment for the seven-year tribulation. The Israel that we see right now, guys and gals, that's not the Israel that's going to be uh, ruling and reigning in the seven-year tribulation for that short time. Um, they have a very powerful military right now. They have a no-nonsense prime minister that is out to get rid of their enemies. During the seven-year tribulation, they're going to rely on somebody else for their protection. They're not going to have strong leadership in Israel. Um, the Bible clearly says that in, I in the book of Isaiah. It says that they've entered into a covenant with death and hell. And it said it shall be annulled. God says your, your, your covenant with death and hell and lies are going to be disannulled. It won't stand. It's not going to work. You, you, you make a deal with nations to divide my land and you're violating my blood covenant that I have with Abraham. You're hurting yourself. You don't want to do that. But since you're going to do that, um, and listen, the grand scheme of things, and I am going to start reading some scriptures. Don't worry. Um, the grand scheme of things is this. Never forget this, ladies and gentlemen. Why does Jesus return to this earth? There's several reasons why. Number one reason, well, God owns the earth. And the way that this is going, what, what humans are doing and what the devil is doing to this earth is not sustainable. Okay? He, God provided a perfect plan of salvation for people if they would only accept the plan. Most of the world is rejecting the plan right now, and they're sinning more and more and more and more, and they're flaunting their sin right in God's face. Not only are they messing with Israel and the blood covenant, because Satan knows it's a blood covenant, by the way, trying to take the land, trying to divide the land that God told Abraham, you and your descendants are going to have. There's people that actually tell me, oh, it's just Abraham. He just made a deal with Abraham, you know, and that's it. And I'm like, no, it's a land... <laughs> It's a land grant with Abraham and his descendants for, for forever, for forever. Where do you think, where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem, okay? He would, he's a Jew, he was born of a Jewish carpenter. His father, Joseph, was a Jewish carpenter. The lineage goes all the way back to Adam, all the way to Joseph. Now, the fascinating thing was, Joseph had nothing to do with, his father had nothing to do with the birth of Jesus, but the lineage went all the way there through David and all of them. Amazing. So who is Isaiah here in the Old Testament? Who, what's Isaiah all about? Did you know that Isaiah, to the religious Jews, uh, he's like the second most important prophet there is in the Bible to them in the Old Testament, except for Moses. Isaiah would be like number two to them. And I know Elijah was important as well, but, but um, Isaiah was considered extremely important to the religious Jews. And so we're plowing through a little bit of what he's saying here about uh, what God spoke to him about bringing Israel forth again in Isaiah 66, 9. And also um, uh, most of through this, okay? I'm going to read a little bit about this because... 
I want y'all to understand, let me take you over to Ezekiel chapter 37, okay? I want to read a little bit of this to set the pace because there's people that just don't know. Good to see you, Sister Betty and Jackson, sir. Good to see you as well. There's just people that don't understand and they don't know, and I can't assume that everybody knows what I know or they know what you all know out there. A lot of you know your Bibles, but we can't assume anybody that's watching this video knows, okay? So I have to go over this. Did you know that the rebirth of Israel is predicted all through the Bible? Why is that so important? For one, because God doesn't break his blood covenant with Abraham, okay? That's number one. Number two is that Jesus used the rebirth of Israel as an indicator for when he's going to return to this earth. Is America going to play a role in the seven-year tribulation? I'm going to tell you, America is absolutely going to play a role in starting the seven-year tribulation. As far as what our role is going to be once it gets going, <laughs> I wouldn't give it much of a future, okay? Okay. That's like the bad news. That's what people don't want to hear. They want to hear, oh, everything's going to be all right. God's going to heal our land and things like that. Okay. Um, look, we have, if you all have been paying attention, like if you're as old as I am and you've been growing up watching this stuff, it's been steadily getting worse and worse and worse. So do you think Donald Trump can fix this? Do you think one man can turn all this around or is it a spiritual problem that we are facing? When you've got people that are in our government that are actually allowing immigrants to come across our border, sounds very harmless, doesn't it, immigrants? But I'm talking about drug lords, gangs, um, prisoners, people from insane asylums coming here. And not only are they letting them in, it's not for the purpose necessarily of, oh, the Democrats are going to get more votes because we're allowing immigrants to come in and we're going to allow them to vote. Yeah, that's part of the strategy, but that's not the whole strategy. Harris Faulkner on Fox News yesterday had some guests on from the government that were saying on the, on the right, the reason why they're letting all of these drug lords in is because the Democrats make money off of the drugs too. That is the cold, hard truth that you're going to very rarely hear about, but they're making money off of the fentanyl, the drugs, and all of that. You know, in the book of Revelation, it says that they repented not of their sorceries. Sorceries in the Greek is literally pharmakia. That's drugs, drugs. They didn't repent of their drug usage. So is the Bible accurate in what it's saying? If you study... And you just don't read something off of the cuff and you move on and you, you don't let it resonate in your spirit and let God speak to you. You won't get it. But if you do, you're going to start thinking, wow, man, the Bible is more accurate than I thought. You know, Betty says Pablo es Escobar told us that it's literally it's what we're seeing is incredible, guys and gals. Like, I mean, uh. It's so surreal for me to be alive in this generation with the rest of you being the generation that's going to see Jesus come. There's going to be people that look might happen upon this video and laugh and laugh and laugh. And then there's going to be another group of people that don't want their lives interrupted and they're not going to want to hear about it. You know, I'm talking to multiple groups of people with this message. Most of what I'm going to tell people today is not popular. They don't want nothing to do with it or they laugh to scorn. And they mock this message. Like all of this world just came together by accident, right? Like it was just a big bang theory and, and there was no intelligent designer behind making this planet livable for human beings to live on, right? <laughs> I mean, come on, really? You, what it comes down to, and I'm, I'm going to talk to a certain group of people here. Your problem is is that you don't want to submit to that God of the Bible who tells you that you're living in sin. That's the real truth. It has nothing to do with denying the existence of a God creating this earth. It has to do with your sinful lifestyle and you don't want to give it up too easy. Okay? You're living under the deception of the devil because the devil has got you fooled into thinking that's a better life than submitting to Jesus. Did you know that submitting a life to Jesus is a much better life than submitting to the devil? Resisting the devil and he'll flee from you, you'll have a much better life as a, 
as a born-again Bible-believing Christian. It's an incredible life because you have a relationship with the Creator. And you can talk to Him and He'll talk to you. How do, you do, how do we do that? Is that something like on TBN or Sid Roth where, oh, God literally, Jesse Duplantis has conversations with God every day, right? Audibly, by the way. <laughs> you know, I, no, not like that. No, I'm talking about in the scriptures. I'm talking, no, can God speak to me in a dream? Yes, he has. But I'm talking about literally like in the Bible, our solid rock where he told Satan in the wilderness, he said, man, uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that's proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you think that was just a casual statement to the devil? No, it wasn't a casual statement. It's literally, it means it. Eva, amen, sister, amen. Uh, God's word, I, I would, you know what I want to do, and I know I'm rabbit trailing, but I just got to mention this to our group, okay? If you take anything away from this, and if, I know, you all know how close we are to the seven-year tribulation. I'm going to keep going with this, but I want to tell you something. To deepen your relationship with the Lord, if you just keep that Bible close to you and you open it up and you start plowing, he is there waiting to talk to you personally. Personally, not just with what we're dealing with in the world, but he's got things to say about you and your life. And when you start talking to him and you open that Bible up, he will give you the answers. I've had many people say to me, why doesn't God answer my prayer? Why doesn't he answer my prayer? Why doesn't he answer my prayer? And I see all of these vague answers and they're like, oh, well, you got to wait for his timing. You got to wait for the, you, you know, you, well, you know, he'll answer you. You just got to know how to look for him. That's a little closer to the truth. The truth is you got to open up your Bible and start reading. Hold on a second. Watch this. Okay? One second. See this? Look at it. See how thick that is? Look how thick that, look how thick that is. Those are words inside of these golden lace pages, all right? Those, that's God waiting to speak to you, all right? Why doesn't God answer my prayer? Why doesn't he talk to me? Why, 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 why don't you open this up and start reading? Why don't you open it up and start reading? And you might, you might be surprised about what happens, okay? God never ceases to amaze me when I do that, when I open up his word. And it's like, I feel convicted in my spirit that I'm like, oh, I'm not doing this enough. <laughs> you know, I love listening to good Bible teachers and everything, but the best Bible teacher in the world is the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you and this right here. That's your best teacher. All right. Now, I, God bless every Bible teacher and pastor and other Christians that know their word. I love getting edified by other people that know the word of God and have the Holy Spirit flowing through them. It's incredible. Okay. Um, Betty says God exalts his word, the Bible, above himself. That is a true statement that blows people away, Betty. You want to know why he does that? He authenticates himself when he does it. Because there's a lot of people that say God this and God this and God this, but we have no idea what God they're talking about. But the God that you mentioned, Betty, and the one that I know as well, he authenticates himself through his own word. And that's how we know who he is. That's how we know who the right, right God is. My sheep know my voice, right? The voice of the stranger, they won't run to. Just thought I would throw that in there. Ezekiel chapter 37. This is about validating the rebirth of Israel in 1948 and why this is so important to grasp. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he carried me out in the spirit in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Imagine being whisked away in the spirit. Ezekiel was whisked away in the spirit by God. So was John on the island of Patmos. <clears throat> Verse two, and he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were many, very many open in the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. You know what? I, I, that's a great answer that Ezekiel gave. When you don't know the answer and you're wondering, I don't know the answer, Lord. I don't know who's going to win next month. You know. God will give you the answer because he knows. Now look, I use the Bible as my, my GPS, okay? So I'm I'm basing my feelings and my 
decisions by navigating the scriptures and letting it tell me a story, I think Trump is going to win. I, you see that all the momentum is on his side. If he wins, by the way, don't look for the Democrats to fade off into the sunset. That's not going to happen. They will scratch, fight, and claw, and they'll probably make J6 in 2020 look like a picnic. So just, just know, Jesus said in Matthew 24, nation would rise against nation and um, um, it literally ethnic group against ethnic group, okay? So it literally means, as an example, Republicans versus Democrats, nations divided against each other, um, kingdoms against kingdoms. So it doesn't necessarily mean one country against another, it means a group or an organization of people against another organization. So they're like fighting with each other. This is exactly what Jesus said, and that's where we are right now. So even if Trump wins, don't look for it to be a peaceful win or a peaceful transition of power. I hate to say that, but that's kind of what it's looking like. I don't want Kamala to win, so bring it on. Bring it on and let's make this happen. Okay. And so when Isaiah asked or told God, he said, I, you know, not me. I don't know if these bones can live. This is, this is the Jewish people. This is when they were scattered all over the world. Again, he said unto me, prophecy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. That's that fig tree generation that we're living in. This is, this is rightly dividing. This is uh, Ezekiel 37. This is Isaiah 66. This is Matthew 24. This is Luke 21. Going just like this, okay? And in the last Bible study that I had, I gave you scriptures in the Old Testament that validate that Israel is that fig tree that Jesus was talking about. But God calls them something else here. He calls them dry bones. Dry bones. Okay? I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And I will lay snooze upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath into you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Well, we certainly found that out, didn't we? Um, okay, Debbie has an update. Uh, Israel has started retaliatory strikes against Iran. I was, I, you know what? I knew that was coming. Debbie, thank you for the update. I want to send everybody this article right now. Pastor Jeffrey over at Now the End Begins just put an article up and I have not had a chance to read it yet, but I would like to share it with you all right now. So this is validates what Debbie is saying. Uh, let me put it in the, in the chat room, okay? Fascinating times that we're living in. Are y'all enjoying hanging out with me? Is this okay? It's so incredible what we're living in right now and what we're seeing. Um, you know, here's the ironic thing. Iran was once called Persia, okay? Well, Cyrus in the Old Testament was from Persia. <laughs> And Cyrus allowed Nehemiah to go back and build the wall and build the temple in Jerusalem. So amazing, amazingly enough, that same nation that allowed Nehemiah to go back is right now called Iran, trying to wipe Israel off the map. Okay? And there is a second Cyrus that's on deck right now. His name is Donald Trump. He is, and don't tell, I didn't pin that name on him. Israel did. They're saying he's the second Cyrus. They have a coin with Cyrus and Trump on the coin because he allowed, um, he moved the, the, the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the U.S. embassy, and he was the catalyst for the Abraham Accords, and it's on hold right now. Okay, I'm, I'm enjoying being with you all as well. So for time's sake, I'm not going to read this article, but I do want to give... Now the end begins a promo. They deserve it. They put a lot of time in. Um, they know the day and the hour. They know, I don't want to say like the day of the hour, the rapture, but they know the day and the hour that we're living in. They're very astute to it. So I want to give them my endorsement and my, um, my advice to go over and follow them over there. They have amazing articles. You sign up with the newsletter. You'll get the newsletter in your text message or in your email. I get them all the time. And they keep me up to speed, okay, with everything that's going on, along with my own independent research. 
Um, but uh, so this was written, it was written about um, 40 minutes ago, I guess. And so it validates what Debbie is saying. So we're going to have to see what Israel does. This is world changing news. What we're seeing right now is world changing because why? Is it just another war, another rumor of war? Because people don't know what's going on. What we're seeing right now, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Think about this. Let me give you an analogy that might be helpful to you. Okay. Um, let's say that you have this great, big, beautiful lawn of green grass out in your front yard, right? And it's time to cut the grass. It's growing and you know, you got to get your lawnmower over it before it gets too thick because it's hard on the blades, right? <laughs> All right. But the problem is you have a bunch of you have a bunch of things out on the lawn that need to be moved first. There's maybe some kids' toys, maybe um, maybe you've got lawn chairs out there, maybe you've got a, a you know an awning or something or whatever. But there's things out there, you know, a dog fence or whatever. You got to move all that out of the way before you can mow the lawn. What we're seeing right now on the world stage, as I speak, by the way, if Israel is hitting a rant right now. What we're seeing is we're seeing God removing all of those items off of the green grass before he mows the lawn. Does that make sense? When's he going to mow the lawn? He's going to mow the lawn after the church is removed off of the earth. But the environment has to be in place before that can happen. So you cannot have a dangerous Iran. You can't have a dangerous Hezbollah. You can't have Hamas running around launching rockets into Israel every day because the environment of the seven-year tribulation is, um, it starts out as a nation that's at peace, okay? It's not going to last long, but that environment has to be created for God to start doing his strange work, his um, incredible work, as it says in Habakkuk, okay? Um, he's going to be doing a strange work and it's gonna be very incredible. But the environment, as we're seeing right now, is happening to create that. And Donald Trump, ladies and gentlemen, I love Donald Trump. God bless him. Um, I pray that he gets good spiritual advisors around him to tell him not to create a Palestinian state. But I feel like that's why God is going to install Mr. Trump back into the White House. I love Donald Trump. Believe me, I've been a pro-Trump guy for a long time now, and he's made mistakes, and I know... I've got some very holy, highly Christians telling me all of these mistakes that he's made um, in his first four years and all that. And I'm like, yeah, okay. When you become president and you've got God behind you, okay, I want to see how well you do in holding up under the Democrat persecution and everybody telling you you need to do this, this, and this, and this. Look, I've been in management positions before, okay, when I was younger. And I want to tell you, you have this vision of how you think you need to run a business or a country until you're actually doing it. And then when you're actually doing it, it's quite the different story. <laughs> yeah, amen, ladies, amen. It's quite the different story once you're in. And then we can look back and be like, oh, look at that mistake. Look at this one. Oh, look at what he said here. Look at this. Like, yeah, okay. Well, what about you when you had these certain low, low times in your life? Were, were we all, are we all pointing the finger and looking at how bad of a decision you made when you were younger or when you were doing into? No, but it's the principle that we want to vote for in the country, okay? Look, pro-abortion, it's not, it's not exactly absolutely pro-pro-pro-abortion, but it's much more pro-abortion than we're going to get with Kamala Harris and those wacko liberals. A lot of other things I can list, but what I'm trying to tell you the bigger picture is that Trump is going to be reinstated by God, I think, okay, and I'm not speaking for the Lord on this, so the Lord, you know, <laughs> I'm going to pray for a Trump win. But what I'm saying is it would make sense to me if he's reinstalled to finish the Abraham Accords and a Palestinian state is created. Now, someone might ask me in the Christian community, why would God allow something that he says he does not want to happen? In other words, his blood covenant being violated and um, why would he allow somebody to divide his land and a Palestinian state created? Because it's a trap. You understand? It's what I'm trying to tell you is that sin, there's an account balance for sin. Okay. The only way that balance 
uh, that account balance can be brought forth is until that last straw has happened, okay? And so God has people that are telling the communities in the world, and not just me, but everywhere else that are paying attention, you're not supposed to touch that land. It's in the word of God. Whether someone wants to pay attention to those warnings is up to them or not, okay? That's what the church does. We're supposed to warn the communities. We're supposed to warn our political leaders. Don't, as an example, but it's a big example in this case, don't touch that land. There's a lot of other things that we warn our communities not to do or what to do, but the big, big, biggie, biggie, biggie is the <laughs> don't touch that land over there. That's Israel's land that God belongs to God. As soon as somebody goes along and they ignore the warnings, you read Joel chapter 3, okay? And Joel chapter 3 absolutely tells you how God reacts to people that divide up his land. The seven-year tribulation begins. So, this is the painting that I see on the wall. The painting that I see on the wall, you no, know, something else. We have 10 days to find out. A Trump re-election, it's going to go horrible because there's going to be people via, violently protesting the win. He's going to get back in the White House, I think. He's going to open the Keystone Pipeline, close the borders. We're going to have to get um, some kind of military-style team to get rid of these criminals out of our country and things, a bunch of cleanup mess in our country. But he's going to absolutely make phone calls with um, Vladimir Zelensky and Vladimir Putin to put a halt on that war. I think he can do it. And he's going to start working on the Middle East, okay, and finishing those Abraham Accords. How fast can it get done? I'm looking at six years left of this generation of the future generation, six years left. It's supposed to all be complete by then. There's six years left after, from 1948, there's six years left because Psalm 90. 10 says, if you're healthy, 80 years you get in a generation, and then we fly away. So you look at a six-year window, and I think it's going to be a lot less for us, the church. But there's this six-year window left, and it's going to happen pretty fast because Trump has four years, okay, to get things done. And I think he's going to start working on it very quickly, very quick. As soon as I, I'm going to make you all a, a commitment to me, okay, and I think what I'm going to do tonight is I'm gonna conclude the, this Bible study for now. I know there was more scriptures I wanted to go over with you, but I'm wired up with, especially after hearing that Iran is, I'm sorry, Israel is starting to hit Iran. I wanna check it out. <clears throat> this is what I wanna tell my Christian community tonight. This is gonna to sound like a radical statement, but everything in the word of God to me that's been coming to pass is radically true. <laughs> all right, I'm just following the waves. All right, I'm following the waves. If I am still here, and if you're still here, the church is still here, if we're still here and we see a Palestinian state created, I'm going to I'm going to quit all of my stuff and I'm going to absolutely commit to a full-time ministry. I will commit to a full-time online ministry any way I can. I'll go to the highways and the byways. I'll go to my com local community here. I'll go to rest homes. I'll go to nursing homes. I'll go everywhere that I can. And I'll just take the money that, I, that I've God has given me built up because I know that we're near at the very door. That's how serious I am and that's how serious God is about it. And I'm telling you 100% that it will not tarry if that Palestinian state is created. It will, God will close the doors on this generation, on this, um, sorry, dispensation. Does that sound like a radical thing? We'll, we'll think about the prospect of a pre-tribulation rapture. Does that seem pretty radical? That God would remove and evacuate his church off of this earth in a pre-tribulation rapture to where we're just poof, gone like that? That's pretty radical, isn't it? How about, think about this for a moment, okay? Think about the Hebrews at the Red Sea and the Egyptians were bearing down on them, okay, in Exodus. And they're panicking because the Egyptians are getting ready to kill them all, six million of them or whatever it was. And they cried out to Moses and Moses cried out to the Lord and he said, what are you, why are you afraid? What are you worried about? He said, stand back and watch the power of the Lord, you know? 
and he instructed Moses to put his staff out and the Red Sea literally parted. How radical is that? How radical is it that God held the Egyptians back? The Hebrews walked across on dry land with a, an ocean being split in half and they walk across to the other side. And as soon as the Egyptians were permitted to go forward, they tried crossing the Red Sea and they all drowned. Does that sound like a radical story to you? I mean, yes, it, it radically, it's radically real and it radically did happen. So what I'm trying to tell you is the pre-tribulation rapture of the church is a, a radical reality that's going to happen. And since I've been a student for so long looking at this, that when I understand how important a blood covenant is with God, that he can't break it, and that if he's going to set a trap for a Christ-rejecting world, opening the storehouses, all right, letting... By the way, this whole BRICS thing with Russia and North Korea and China and all them, you want to know who they are? You want to know their role in the seven-year tribute? Those are the kings of the East. Those are the kings of the East that are going to be fighting with the Antichrist and his ten nations. Just so that you all understand. So don't look at it as an anomaly that um, Putin is getting recruitment and help from Kim Jong-un with North Korean troops going over to, to Ukraine to fight over there. That is like, that's the catalyst of a world war. Um, but by the way, let me, let me give you this disclaimer as well. Since the Christian community is hanging out with me this evening, my definition of World War III is probably different than what a lot of other people's version is, okay? Because it's not literally the tanks exchanging fire with other tanks. It's that red horse of war in um, Revelation chapter uh, 5, okay? It's a red horse of war. And what, what was this horse given power to kill many? And it was given a great sword. And to me, that's the, that is the World War III that's coming. Can you feel it? Guys and gals, can you feel how close we are? I mean, this is so exciting of a time to be alive right now. And we have been chosen to be blessed to be alive to see it all. There would be only one other time that I would, I would want to be alive other than now would be the first coming of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would love to have been in Galilee. I got to go there, right? But to, to, to be at his feet and listen to him. And follow him oh man you know but this to me is another extremely exciting time because we have the prospect of being raptured alive we are blessed Debbie what does it say in Titus 2 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great who great God and Savior Jesus Christ he is God he is not a God he's not a little God he's not a God he is, there's only one God in the Bible. God manifests himself through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's the glorious appearing. That is the rapture of the church. That is not the second coming. <laughs> All right. Now look, I'm going to plow more in Isaiah. I'm going to try to get another one in tomorrow. And then on, on Sunday, I'm going to do some praying. And if you all want to join me for the prayer for a Trump win... That's my plan. So, goodness. I should be out of breath, but I'm not. I'm, I'm pretty stoked right now. America is a catalyst to start the seven-year tribulation. I'm convinced, okay? There's going to be other nations that have a part in that as well, but America is going to be a catalyst. Um, these elections are going to launch us into the seven-year tribulation. That's what I feel. I'm not picking a day and an hour. You're welcome, Debbie. I'm a radical Christian. I'm sorry, some of the audience out there that doesn't ever comment and thinks, oh, this dude's crazy, man. I know, we've been called crazy for a long time, I know. But the Bible just keeps on, keeps on keeping on, you know? It keeps on being right, all right? Where are some of you all getting your philosophies and your opinions from, and how well are they holding up? Is it hold up against Scripture? Are you right all the time? Like God's word is right all the time? Who's really the radical here? Believing in your own opinions and your own intellect, that's, that's fallible. People never want to admit their mistakes. Kamala Harris never admits her mistakes. She deflects to Donald Trump is a fascist every time they ask her 
why the border is the way it is. You've had three and a half, four years to keep our, us safe. Oh, it's Donald Trump is a fascist, okay? That's deflection. That's called the human side of emotional people never wanting to accept responsibility. It's easier to deflect. It's easier to point your finger at something else. But when I point my finger into the word of God, it's no longer my reputation that's at stake. It's God's word reputation that's at stake. As long as I'm rightly dividing, as long as I'm quoting the scriptures correctly and not misleading people, the Holy Spirit helping me, and it will be fulfilled, by the way. So God bless all of you. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. If something really crazy happens in the next 24 hours, I'll come back on sooner. If it's the middle of the night, I'll do it. You can watch me when I'm not live. It's okay, but I'll do it for y'all. I love our group. God bless you. Love NTEB. I love a lot of other ministries that are working hard. I'll see y'all later, okay? God bless all of you. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening.